In California, Gavin Newsom beats his recall in a landslide. All the big or not so big product announcements from Apple and remembering one of the most influential comedians of a generation. Wednesday need to know, let's go. Good morning, this is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Wednesday, September 15th. I'm Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Hi, Carlo. Happy hump day, Jill. I am dealing, or I should say I'm coming off dealing with a level one poop catastrophe <laughs> over here. All the reinforcements, I'm calling them in. Uh, DEFCON 1, I don't understand for the life of me how it is possible for one to get poop in one's belly button. Um, okay, so I just saw in our notes, poop catastrophe in red, and I'm like, oh no, what is going on at Carlo's house? And I'm thinking you've got poop on the walls, etc. But the belly button yet. also equally interesting. Yes, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I, it's, the, it's the breakfast hour here. We shouldn't, I shouldn't be talking so scatologically so early in the morning. Uh, forgive me, but that's what's going on over in my neck of the woods here. Um, and Carlo, th- and thank, I just want to give a big thanks to Baker, who really has been stepping up. Um, you were oh, yeah. away. I have had just random days because yeah. of just the end of summer combined with um, the Jewish holidays and the start of school, etc. Tomorrow I'm also going to be out because it's Yom Kippur. Um, ah, okay which is uh, the Jewish Day of Atonement. Um, and then I think that should do it for the days off. So I think, I think basically Friday and then officially Monday, we'll, we'll kind of be back to normal on this podcast. Okay, good to know. Okay, Carlo, let's get to the news here. Gavin Newsom will remain the governor of California at least until next year's election. Newsom easily beat the Republican effort to recall him from office on strong turnout from Democrats, according to AP projections. Ballots marked no on the question to recall Newsom were ahead by a 30-point margin with two-thirds of the votes counted. Um, The race was called at about midnight Eastern time, just about an hour after the polls closed. And I think it's a good thing that the margin was so big because it sounded like um, Republicans were already hinting at at kind of propagating a a big lie part two. Um, So good. Good to see. Yes. About voter fraud saying that there was. Yes. If if news there were things like if Newsom wins, it's because it was a fraudulent election. So it doesn't yeah. sound like that's happening. I think Elgin very hard succeeded. To, yeah, it's very hard to do that with a 30-point uh, deficit, although I'm sure people will try in the years to come. Democratic leaders in the California State Assembly, meanwhile, already saying that they want to put a referendum on recalls, basically a recall of the recall on the ballot uh, next year. Basically, They're basically just saying, like, this, this has got to stop. This is, like, too much. <laughs> right? I, mean, I think my, the, I, I'm, I, the word is not... Um, succeeded by the way it was conceded i'm like it's it's way too early for me <laughs> this morning um, i didn't even notice uh, That's but good. that is good though a recall on the recalls we've been talking about how crazy this recall is yeah. anyway yeah i mean th- that would face really stiff opposition from republicans in that state who see the recall as sort of like one of the last avenues they have of power in California, which is blue and getting bluer by the, every year. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk already about how this was like a disaster re- for Republicans or specifically for Trumpism or like this huge win for Democrats nationally. I, I don't really see it either way there. I mean, California, as we've discussed, Jill, is just too weird, right? It's too idiosyncratic, too much of an outlier to, I think, draw any sweeping conclusions from this. That said, I, you know, because the margins were so big, it could definitely give a boost to Newsom's presidential ambitions, which we know he has. Um, Okay, let's talk COVID here. It's continuing to look like we may be on the other side of the Delta wave of the pandemic, although it's not uh, an even decline by any means. So new COVID cases are continuing to fall nationally based on the seven day average. We're now down about 14% from the peak on September 1st, but cases are still on the rise in certain states like West Virginia and Kentucky. A lot of hospitals in the South are now at or near ICU capacity, which of course makes sense given how hospitalizations and also deaths are these lagging indicators as we've often talked about here on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So there's not a single free ICU bed in all of Alabama at the moment, while two dozen hospitals in Florida are reporting having more ICU patients than beds. God, that's crazy, isn't it? Amazing. 
18 months into this. Uh, meanwhile, I just wanted to mention this and not as any reason to like make fun of or anything just because it's news. You know, another conservative anti-vax radio host has died of COVID. Bob Enyard of Denver. Uh, this guy was infamous out there for mocking AIDS patients and suggesting the death penalty for women who have abortions. He succumbed uh, to the coronavirus. He is the fifth right wing radio host to die in six weeks. I mean, that's become like literally one of the most dangerous jobs in America. Uh, just once more for the people in the back, the coronavirus does not care about your politics. It only cares if you have a respiratory tract, right? Um, I also wanted to mention quickly about a timeline on vaccines for kids. Pfizer's mm. CFO was talking to a conference at, at Morgan Stanley, according to CNBC. Um, he basically said they're expecting results for kids aged 5 to 11 by the end of September. And then the plan would be to file for emergency use authorization in early October. OK, so now if you're sticking with that timeline, it takes about three to six weeks for the FDA to review um, the data and then approve it. So if you do the math, we're talking potentially November for vaccines for, for young kids, mm -hmm. five to 11. And then some new info, which we'd not heard about um, vaccines for even younger kids, toddlers, Pfizer CFO saying kids six months to five years. That data is only about a month behind the other data. So potentially, if everything goes well and, and it, it is proving to be safe, mm -hmm. we're looking at potentially December for when vaccines could be available for the youngest kids, um, which is a game changer. So, big time. but as you mentioned yesterday, I think it was it was yesterday on the podcast. The big question here is if parents do get their kids vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think even parents who were gung ho to get themselves vaccinated might be weary of getting their kids vaccinated. So we'll see. I, I mean, we don't know yet. Yeah. Depends, I no, think, how bad think, it gets in terms right, of the Delta exactly. wave. I think this is going to be one of the big questions this fall and winter for sure. Uh, meanwhile, uh, poverty actually declined in the United States last year during one of the biggest shocks to the economy and the labor market in history. This is according to new census data that shows the percentage of people living below the poverty line hit a record low in 2020, even as the pandemic wiped out millions of jobs. The massive amounts of government aid in the form of stimulus checks and other reliefs uh, benefits uh, appeared to have helped avert a much worse recession. This is, this is really um, quite remarkable. I mean, we sort of knew this was the case, but the census data tells us for sure now. One round of stimulus checks, those stimul first stimulus checks that President Trump uh, sent out early last year, it cost $500 billion, and they lifted 11.7 million people out of poverty, according to the census. Wow, that's amazing. That is money well spent, if you ask me. Um, though we should note at the same time, that same census data shows that median household income fell last year by close to 3%. That's the most significant decline since 2011 when we were still digging out uh, from the Great Recession. Um, as expected, Apple announced its newest line of iPhones featuring slightly bigger screens, better cameras and faster processors. The iPhone 13 design is more or less the same as the last model, as is the price. Apple also unveiling a new entry level iPad and an updated iPad mini and a new version of the Apple Watch with a bigger display. The rumors that ne uh, the next-gen AirPods would be announced, that did not come to pass. Um, I was looking forward to an AirPods announcement. Um, but it's yeah. basically like the big news here is that there really wasn't a lot of big news. Um, yeah. But, you know, the data has shown Apple had its best year ever last year. Um, iPhones are still crushing it. And more people, yeah. despite the fact that there's just these incremental changes and improvements, uh, people, more and more people are still flocking to the iPhone. Yeah. And the Apple Watch is really fascinating to me because it would be it's like there's it's Apple's like smallest product line by far. But it would be I forget what the numbers are, but it makes like hundreds of billions of dollars a year. It would be like the biggest product of for any other company just by itself. But the Apple Watch, I have to say, I, I and tell me if I'm wrong here, but it's something it's one of those things that I just do not understand. To me, it is such an unappealing product. I and but, but at the same time, I see so many people who use them. So there must be some kind of purpose. But it just seems like every Thing you can do with an Apple Watch you can do with an iPhone and it has the benefit of not looking so corny in my opinion at least I I think that the the appeal for the Apple Watch has a lot to do with health and fitness in terms right. of monitoring heart rates and things like that and Apple is doubling down on fitness they they did another piece of news that came uh, out yesterday is they're kind of expanding their offerings in their um, Apple Fitness Plus app mm -hmm. um, 
they have group workouts. Again, they monitor your health. I think that that's part of the appeal with the watch. Um, you don't and, have and one of those, do you? I, I have one, actually. Uh, I just don't wear it. Which yeah. and my husband bought it for me, and he's like, every once in a while, he's like, "What's up with the Apple Watch?" And at this <laughs> point, it's old. At this point, I, I guess I would need a new one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think also younger people love the watch. I, my really? um, niece and nephews who are younger, they wear they they have wearables. I don't know if it's an Apple right. Watch, but like they always are checking their steps, you know, yeah. which is just fascinating. Because I, I think I, when you're older, never, you're like not, yeah. I, I think it's a harder, um, it's harder to convince people to wear yeah. wearables. I mean, I'm out of the zeitgeist at this point. I, I, so, yeah, I, I get that. I'm just, I don't want more computers on my body, I guess. The phone is good enough for me. Um, okay, top executives at Facebook have come to the conclusion that Instagram is harmful to a significant percentage of teens Girls in particular, that according to internal studies leaked to the Wall Street Journal, according to the journal, the research shows that Instagram's Explore page is particularly well suited to exacerbate feelings of inadequacy. According to Instagram's own analysis, quote, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Reading from the journal article, quote, among teens who reported suicidal thoughts, 13% of British users and 6% of American users trace the desire to kill themselves to Instagram. The app has experimented with ways to tackle this issue, like hiding the counts uh, on posts, but found that those sort of fixes really didn't have much of an effect. Basically, um, the basic mechanics of the photo sharing app are what makes it so potentially harmful to teenagers. Uh, frightening and also yeah. frightening just what it's doing to kids and frightening that kind of Facebook knows this and it's just kind of in it the lies, acceptance uh, uh, phase of yeah. it. I don't know. Well, and they spin it uh, to talk about how it's actually this great thing. Don't forget, Facebook is still working on an Instagram for kids. They're still trying to do that. I, it's, it's, I mean, my blood is going to start to boil. It actually really almost started to boil when you were just reading this, even though I read this whole piece in the journal yesterday. Um, I, I just, it makes me so angry. It really does. In, in one of Facebook's own studies of teenagers, more than 40% of Instagram users who reported feeling unattractive said those feelings started when they were using the app. I mean, that's just so sad. And if you're wondering why there seem to be so many of these stories lately, specifically about Facebook and what Facebook is sort of doing to society, that's because that company is leaking like a sieve, right? Which It's just... Facebook employees are leaking internal documents to the media, which suggests to me, at least, there's a lot of people employed at that company who know that what they're doing, however well-intentioned it may be, is having a deleterious and negative effect on our society. So instead of quitting, it's hard to quit. That's a very good place to work. They have amazing benefits. I know people who work there. The the, the culture is it, people like it and they pay really well. But instead of quitting, these people are just leaking to the media, which I think makes them feel better. But we, we got to do something about this. Is this and maybe I'm just speaking as a new father, but I just I mean, it's just how how could we let this happen to our kids? So I've thought a lot about this because I, I read the article as well. Um, and of course, we both now have young daughters. Yeah. And part of me just feels like it's, it's just, I don't know if it's anything so specific to Instagram. I think that we're going to find out, my guess would be that we're going to find out that probably TikTok down the line is also mm -hmm. having this, maybe, I don't know. I mean, maybe sure. there's yeah. something different about the TikTok experience because it's a little, it's more maybe fun with videos yeah. and, and whatever. Um, but I just think we, it's human nature, right? Like, I mean, like in yeah. everything on social media just exacerbates human nature, right? So are we as political in person as we are on social media? No, because we just kind of no, go to exactly, our worst right. instincts. Um, right. And I, I thought about this and it's like, it's like, this is going to sound so crazy, but I was, I had to go. I seldom am I'm at big events anymore, and I seldom see mm -hmm. people, really, that, unless I plan on, on seeing them if they come over we, or a play date, et cetera. And I took my daughter to this big soccer class the other day, and I didn't know anybody really there. I knew a couple people, and I, I was seeing all these moms. And, like, I finally feel like I've gotten the parent thing down, like the working parent <laughs> thing, and I'm feeling good about myself. I've also started to work out. I'm feeling better in general yeah, about my life. Good for you. Um, and I went to this, to this class, 
And I just saw like all these moms in their trendy new jeans and they looked so cute and they all knew each other and every, and I have never felt worse. My daughter wouldn't a do, wouldn't do the class, okay? She was like, I'm, right. I, not for me. I want a snack and I want to sit in the shade. Totally cool. Um, and then that. I was sitting there in like my sweatpants and my t-shirt and I'm looking again at these moms in these trendy clothes. So I think, you know, I, the, the point of this story isn't woe is me. It was more like, you know, yeah. Instagram just brings that home to you, right? Exactly. So that feeling, I Bingo. left there just being like, get me out of this place. I, I never, my husband is now going to take my daughter to this class. I'm never going back. Um, <laughs> and it, I, part of it was, it, I was com- obviously, it's human nature. I'm like comparing myself to all these other people. Right. Um, and again, I think that that's just, it's human nature. Um, it plays on our own insecurities. And we're right. sitting at home. Instead of going out and you can eventually leave, you've got your phone attached to your hand. And you're unfortunately bringing these images into you know, in, in basically invading people and especially young people with these images 24 seven. And I'm a grown woman, I'm an adult. Right. I have thick yes, skin, exactly. I've been in the TV business for years, I've heard everything. <laughs> um, you know, people, I, you know, again, I have very thick skin and a pretty good self-esteem, but you know, I, I get it. I, I, feel, I feel for these kids. No, I totally, Jill. And I mean, I remember having those feelings in high school, right? But the thing is, when high school's over, you go home and you don't really think about all the people who like made fun of you or bullied you the rest of the day. Now you just see it all day long, to your point. And that's the thing. It's just these AI algorithms that just exacerbate the worst of human nature. And we have to figure out a way to tackle it. That story was just so botched. And I hope that didn't go on forever. And I know we're, we're running out of time, but it's just... Um, I really feel for these kids and I, I don't know what the answer is because the genie's out of the bottle. Social media yeah, is right. here um, and we are by nature, that's what we do. We compare ourselves to other people and, and I don't know if it's working in, on building up kids' self-esteem. Like I don't know if that's the answer because I don't know if you're gonna be able to fix social media at this point. Yeah. Um, qu- and before we go, I just wanna mention this huge loss in the comedy world. Norm MacDonald has died after a really long and private battle with cancer at the age of 61. MacDonald came up on the Canadian stand-up circuit before he landed a coveted gig on Saturday Night Live in the mid 90s, where he became the influential host of Weekend Update. His routine became famous for how hard he went um, on the OJ on OJ Simpson during the trial, despite the reported displeasure of NBC execs. McDonald always claimed he was fired from SNL because he wouldn't stop calling Simpson a murderer, even after the head of NBC at the time told him to tone it down. A true one of a kind, uh, a master of deadpan, co- deadpan comedy. McDonald beloved in comedy circles. Tina Fey once called him the last dangerous SNL cast member, which I love uh, and is probably true. He was one of my personal favorites, and I would wager a lot of people in our generation of our age came up laughing at his bits on SNL and in stand-up on talk shows like David Letterman over the years. His weekend updates were just legendary. You know, they would not, if you, if you go back and watch some of these clips, they would not make it an episode in today's climate. Um, but just a couple recommendations here, um, especially for younger folks listening who may not uh, know much of Norm MacDonald's work. I have three recommendations you can find on YouTube. The first is his moth joke, moth, M-O-T-H, uh, which is a masterclass in comedic timing and dramatic tension. You can just Google Norm MacDonald moth joke. He says it on the Conan O'Brien show. Um, he also has a very emotional uh, send off to David Letterman on Letterman's last show. That's also on YouTube, which is a great uh, stand up uh, uh, set. And he does a Comedy Central roast of Bob Saget uh, that is really known in comedic circles as sort of a genius subversion of that genre. So all of those things are available on YouTube if you want a good laugh today. Um, but truly one of my favorites and, and gone too soon. It sounds like he was really a um, like a comedian's comedian. Yeah, exactly. Carlo, which is something I really, really appreciated because um, I, I guess I never, I never really appreciated him when he was alive. It, I never, mm-hmm. I'm not that familiar with his comedy, but yeah. in, in his death, like always, we get obits yeah. and tributes. Um, David Letterman actually wrote something great on, on uh, he has a great statement on it that I just want to read. He says, um, in every important way in the world of stand-up, Norm was the best, an opinion shared by me and all peers, always up to something, never certain until his matter-of-fact delivery leveled you. I was always delighted by his bizarre mind and earnest gaze. I'm trying to avoid using the phrase twinkle in his eyes. He was a lifetime Cy Young winner in comedy, 
gone, but impossible to forget. Well said, Mr. Letterman, well said. Um, okay, that is what you need to know for Wednesday, September 15th. All right, guys, hasta mañana.